Hey church, how are you doing? I hope and pray you are still staying encouraged. Um, it's been a long time since we've all met together. I pray that is soon. I was wondering if you have a nickname, if someone has ever given you a nickname or ever called you something. Um, I, I never had a nickname uh, given to me. I am afraid by saying this, a whole bunch of people are going to try to give me a nickname. But if I get a nickname, I hope I have a cool nickname like this guy in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. His name is Joseph, but his nickname that is given to him is Barnabas. And his name means son of encouragement. What an awesome nickname to have given to yourself. And after we get through this whole thing we're going through, I hope that some of us are given the nickname, or at least the churches or the believers, the Christians, are given the nickname, the Sons of Encouragement, through this whole thing. This morning as we go through our message, uh, my desire is really for us to pick up one or two points of areas that we can learn to be an encouragement to the world around us. And I believe God's calling us to this, and I desire this for you and for myself as well. But before we get into that, let's say a word of prayer and just ask God to turn our hearts toward Him as we worship Him and then listen to His Word. Father, thank You so much that um, through Your strength, through Your power, You give our flesh, our weakness, the ability to actually be an encouragement to others. Father, I pray that, that we would be encouraged through Your Word, we'd be encouraged through worship as we spend time with You in this moment right now. Lord, give us one or two things that you're asking us to adjust in our life to be able to be an encouragement to others. Father, for your glory, for your, for your honor, Lord, may we learn to be an encouragement to the world around us. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
through this time that's really hard and it's really at best odd but probably hard for all of us that we can find our way to worship find our way to worship yes through songs and that that's a good avenue for worship but worship through our daily lives through our actions worship through how we relate with our families with whom we are quarantined a lot of times Worship with how we relate with people who maybe are handling this differently than us. Worship because we can look at the scriptures and we can see truth. Lord, I pray, Lord, that all of our actions, all of our words come right back to to worshiping you. Worshiping you for who you are because you are Christ, our Savior, the one who has paid it all for us. May we stand with our arms lifted high in worship to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the
and humbly reciprocate love to you. The only way we can love is because you have first loved us. And Lord, we humbly try to reciprocate that to you each day. Accept our humble offering, we pray. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Last week, I sent you out a video clip um, to start thinking through this process of what it means to be an encouragement in our world that is very full of discouragement right now. I likened the believer to a juicy dewberry that can be enjoyed in a world full of thorns. I want to continue that thought this morning, and so I would encourage you, if you haven't watched that clip, to go back and watch it so you have the full context. But I believe as Christians, we can be a huge blessing and encouragement to the world around us, not only to the world, but to each other. The, the picture of being an encouragement is not a new one. We know from Matthew 5 that we are encouraged to be the light of the world. We're told we are the light of the world. We're told that we are the salt of the earth. We are God's aroma, Corinthians tells us, in this world. What a beautiful opportunity we have as believers in our world full of darkness right now, to be a light that shines bright. In a world full of bitterness, we get to provide flavor and preserve. In a world full of stench, we are a beautiful aroma. We, the believers, are a treasured possession in this world right now, and we get to be an encouragement to the lives of those around us. We're going to continue this thought as we look at first. Thessalonians chapter 5. The early church was experiencing pressure of living in a life of uncertain times. They, they felt the pressure of thorns. Some of them had even questioned if the second coming of Christ had already happened. And I'm not going to give you the full context of all the verses there. You can read the whole chapter, the whole letter for you. But Paul reminds them that they are children of light. They are children of light belonging to the day. And because they belong to the, the day they will know when the day of the Lord is coming. I'm going to read through these verses uh, almost uh, point by point as I go through them. And to continue the theme of being a Dewberry Christian, I'm going to use the word Dewberry as an acronym this morning. Dewberry is spelled D-E-W-B-E-R-R-Y. So we are going to be Dewberry Christians this morning. The first point and the first letter is D, and that is to be diligently aware. Diligently aware. And we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1-4, through 4, our first points, and I'll read them to you now. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need of anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains coming upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for the day to surprise you like a thief. Diligently aware. Paul says that he has no need to write to them about the times and the seasons of the second coming of the Lord because if they are in the light, if they are walking with Christ, they should be fully aware of when the day of the Lord is. He then provides in verses 3 and 4 two pictures, two images of the sudden day of the Lord coming. He's saying the day of the Lord will be like a thief coming in the night or like labor pains of a pregnant lady. These illustrations speak of something sneaking up on you or happening very sudden or almost surprising you. I remember when our second child was born, I was a bit surprised. My wife woke me up in the early morning, and our first child took their time to get here. And so I assumed my second child would also take his time to get here. But no, not the second born. He wanted to come, and he wanted to come quickly. I remember the urgent feeling as we were speeding down the, hosp- uh, down the highway to get to the hospital. And we got there in time. I've heard plenty of stories, and you know people too, who didn't get to the hospital in time, or the baby decided it wanted to be born at home instead of the hospital. But there was a sense of urgency. Even though I was prepared, even though I knew the child would come, I still was taken off guard. 
as Christians, as followers of Christ, we can be aware of the second coming of Christ. We can live, as it were, to have an eye to the sky, knowing that God will return at any moment. You may ask, what does this have to do with being an encouragement to the world around us? What does this have to do for us to be a Dewberry Christian? Well, it's when we as believers keep the main thing, the main thing, when we keep Christ's return in focus, we are better ready and prepared to help those around us. Our world needs Christians who are focused in and who are dialed in, knowing that the day of the Lord will come. I feel it also necessary to add here that if you're not a follower of Christ, the day of the Lord will be scary for you. You need to know the Lord. You need to be prepared for when He does come back for His people. And so I encourage you to come to know Him, learn about His first coming, and then begin anticipating His second coming. Pray and talk to the Lord. Or call me and let's talk about God together. The second point I want to bring out is E. Embracing the light. And we see that in verses 5 through 7. It says, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not sleep so as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. To be awake and to be sober uh, means that you're with it. And these are two word pictures that Paul gives here again of what it means to be in the light. To be awake, to be sober, to, be, to have your mind controlled, not controlled by some substance. And what was happening biblically here is some of the people were giving up. They thought Christ had already returned, and so they were giving up. What, what does it matter being a Christian? They returned back to their sin Some of them were getting in a drunken stupor. They were walking back into darkness. These verses here, Paul reminds them of their true identity in Christ as children of light. They can be children of light. Their identity is as His children. And again, why is this important for us to be an encouragement in the world around us? Well, when the Christian believer knows who they are in Christ, when we know we are children of light, when we know we are sons of the day, It's part of our identity. We know who Christ has called us to be. When a Christian one day is walking in darkness and one day walking in the light, they don't know who they are or where they're going. It is definitely hard for them to be an encouragement to others as well as for them to be confident in who they are in Christ. When we walk in Christ, we allow His light to shine through us. And through that, we are an encouragement to others. The next point is W. And that is to wear faith, hope, and love. And this is found in verses 8 through 10. Wear faith, hope, and love. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. For God has not designed us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live for Him. Verse 8 tells us to put on or to wear faith, hope, and love. These are qualities that are provided through the Holy Spirit. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, He begins to transform us. The Holy Spirit begins to do work in us. And so that when we reach out to our world, it is the Holy Spirit actually flowing through us, ministering to others. It is really hard to minister to others without the help of the Holy Spirit. It's just human effort if the Holy Spirit is not flowing and working through us. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us faith when we're faithless. Gives us faith when we're having a very hard time trying to communicate to someone the truth of God's Word. When they're discouraged. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us hope when we're in a hopeless situation. And we may try to give hope through our own human effort, but when the Holy Spirit is flowing through us, true, genuine hope is provided as an encouragement. The Holy Spirit gives us love when we are selfish, when we want to not be loving or not be caring. The Holy Spirit gives us the gift of love to give to others. We need the Holy Spirit to flow through us. 
Encouragement cannot come through our own human effort. It has to flow through God working through us. Encouragement always comes from God above. B, to be a Dewberry Christian, the letter B is to build one another up. And that's found in verses 11 and verses 14 and 15. Verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, just as you are doing. In verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Seek that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do the good to one another and to everyone. Right here in these verses, God or Paul points out three different people that need to be encouraged. The first one is to admonish the idle. Admonish the lazy, as it were. Right here in Scripture, God gives us permission to give each other a kick in the pants when we need one. Sometimes we need a swift kick. Sometimes we're lazy in our Christian walk. We know what we should do. We know what we want to do. But we need someone to come along and admonish the idle. Admonish those who are getting lazy in their faith. The second people that need to be encouraged is the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted, he says. Sometimes we get discouraged. We all know what it is like to walk through a day of discouragement and someone comes along and just says one word or just sits with us and lifts up our spirits because of their presence. Sometimes there are those who get faint-hearted or discouraged more quickly than others. That's okay. Maybe it's their personality. Come alongside them and encourage them. Speak life into them. They need you to walk alongside them when they are feeling faint and weary. It also says to help the weak. And I was kind of wondering, who are the weak among us? Perhaps the weak among us are those who quickly fall into temptation during difficult times. I heard an article, uh, a news bulletin recently about how those who struggle with addictive personalities um, are, are struggling extra hard during the coronavirus. Those who deal with overeating or alcohol or pornography or drugs are given into more temptation right now due to uh, all the trials they're facing. I think it's a sign of weak. They're struggling. And God is calling us and, and encouraging us in these verses to help the weak. Come alongside, help the weak in this season. Come alongside and help those who are extra vulnerable, encouraging them. And verse 14 also says at the end of the verse to do it with patience. We need to help each other out and do it with a loving, patient attitude. Perhaps this means that we might get discouraged when we're helping others out. Perhaps it may mean that we'll get taken advantage of. It can be discouraging to help others out. In fact, verse 15 says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but seek to do the good of each other. One word at a time. One word at a time. Brick by brick, we can build each other up and encourage one another. It only takes one word to tear someone down. But it takes a lot of words to build them back up. It's important. It's important. Admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. And be patient with them. Stop and think with me for a moment, if you will, of just three people. Three people. Think of one person right now in your life that you know is walking idle, walking lazily in their Christian life. Will you commit to encouraging them? Think now of one person who is faint-hearted. One person who is just really discouraged with everything going on. Will you commit to walking alongside them and encouraging them? Think of one person who is weak. One person who is really struggling with temptation right now. Will you commit to pray for them? And then later this week, call them up and talk to them? 
They need your encouragement. This is what it means to be a Dewberry Christian, to be life-giving, to be encouragement in the world around us. We identify those who are struggling to walk out their faith, who are struggling with laziness. We identify those who are faint-hearted and discouraged. We identify those who are weak, and we go after them, and we seek them out, and we seek to encourage them and to speak life into them. E, the next letter is E, esteem spiritual leaders. And this is brought out in verses 12 and 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonishing you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be patient among yourselves. In the biblical context of these verses, the early church of Thessalonica was having a hard time adjusting to their new leaders. They really enjoyed their previous leaders and they were having a hard time adjusting to them. As a pastor here at our church, I just uh, feel so blessed by a church that honors and cares for their leaders. I know that the last several weeks have been difficult as the leadership team and I have walked through seeking to honor our governing authorities, as well as seeking to obey Christ's command to meet together and care for each other. I know bringing up these verses almost feels a bit self-serving as a, for a pastor to highlight them, but they are in the chapter, so I feel like I need to bring them up. Uh, but, but these verses are also, um, they're not too, too self-serving if you put them alongside other verses in Scripture. In Hebrews 13, pastors are told that they will have to give an account for every soul that they were responsible to ministering to on the day of judgment. That is very humbling for me to realize that I need to give an account for your soul on the way I treated you. We're called to honor each other, humbly care for one another. I've learned that when it comes to honoring authority, it's very easy until there's a problem. Like, I can honor authority until authority's not doing what I like. (laughs) But whether our authority is at home or church or government, we're called to honor them, as long as honoring them does not keep us from honoring our highest authority, and that is Jesus Christ. And let's face it, in the last several weeks, this has not been easy for anyone. This has been difficult for all of us. We've all questioned our attitude and our motives, and we've questioned if authorities over us actually care about us, or if they have alternative or secret motives or not-so-secret motives in play. It's been difficult. But why is it important for us to honor authority to be an encouraging Christian? Why is it important for us to honor authority? You know, there's nothing like a rebellious spirit to bring down the temper, the temperament in a room. Someone who is just full of rebellion and angry toward authority, when they walk in the room, they just discourage everyone. We could give a lot of biblical examples of this. Different people who God admonished because of their rebellion toward their leaders. If we want to be an encouragement to others, then we want to be mindful of our speech, mindful of the authority that God has placed over us, walking with love and respect. And I pray and trust that God will help us do this in a way that is honoring Him as well as those over us. The first R in Dewberry is to rejoice always. And you have to love these verses, starting at verse 16 through 19. It says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. I love those verses. They're special verses to us that we, that we enjoy. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Don't quench the Spirit. I was, thinking, I was thinking about my critical attitude, how this, when I walk in criticism, how it stops rejoicing, how when I walk in criticism, it keeps me from praying, it keeps me from being thankful, and it causes me to quench the Spirit of God. 
I want to share a real personal example of this. Um, Through most of my life, I have struggled with a critical attitude and a complaining spirit. (laughs) I have it well in many ways. I am a very blessed person. But all throughout my life, I have managed to find an opportunity to complain about just about everything. I have found an opportunity to be critical about just about everything that I've experienced or has been given to me. Some years or weeks or months, it's better than others. But this has been a real struggle for me, being critical or having a complaining spirit or muttering displeasure under my breath. Recently, God has really been working on me in this area. God has really been calling me out. And I I could give you a lot of personal examples, but I'm I'm just going to give you one. I call this story the forever home. As you know, our family size has has grown, and due to our call as pastoring here in Atmore, we have chosen to make Atmore, Alabama our forever home, our forever location, or at least while we're raising our children, Lord willing, we will continue here. To make the home that we're currently living in our forever home, to make it great for our children growing up, we decided to purchase some land adjacent to the property. We did this so I could plant an orchard, possibly raise some animals, let our kids run wild in the backyard. We wanted to make it a little bit nicer, a more long-term residence location for us. We also added some space on our house, a larger living room, some more bedrooms, a study for me to work out of. We, we spent a lot of time over the years spending and saving up to do this type of a building project, but of course it always was more expensive than we expected. But we reminded ourselves in the process of building that it would be worth it. It was worth the investment in our family, in our future, our friends. It was worth the investment. Last summer, we finished up the majority of our building. Life was looking good heading into the fall. I was loving it. And then around December of last year, I noticed some construction taking place at the end of our road. I did a little bit of research and I realized that it was a paving company coming into town. I realized that an asphalt company would not be a very pleasant neighbor. Not only would it stink, but they would be noisy. I began to be a little frustrated. Why hadn't my city officials told me about this and given me an opportunity to vote? Why didn't they let me speak voice whether or not I wanted this new noisy neighbor? I don't even know if I would have had a voice to say anything or not. I even began to think of ways I could vandalize the property. (laughs) Did I mention I was frustrated? I don't know why or what I would even consider doing, but I was angry. I was angry at God. God, why did you allow us to put all this money into this house and this property only to have our forever home kind of destroyed by a noisy neighbor moving in next door? It really hit me the first day I came outside and I smelt hot tar. (laughs) I walked across the backyard. I heard a tailgate of a dump truck slam, and I cussed. Did I mention I was mad? Why, God? Why are you destroying this paradise that we designed here in Atmore? God, was it too much to ask? I'm trying to prepare sermons. Can I have a quiet, peaceful spot on this earth to enjoy? It was hard to rejoice. It was hard to pray continually. It was hard to be thankful about anything, and my actions were definitely quenching the Holy Spirit. Several months passed into the spring here, and I've been consumed with a critical and complaining spirit every time I've walked out my backyard. But as the months have unfolded, I began to understand something was happening. Something was happening very, very dangerous. I was losing intimacy. My critical spirit was building a wall 
between my wife, between me and my children, and between me and my God. I, I repented of my sin, and I asked God to restore my joy and to help me to find a new appreciation for my noisy and smelly neighbors. God has answered my prayer in this area, and He has really helped me. And not every time, but just about every time I I hear the thundering tailgate slam on a dump truck, or every time I smell asphalt blowing across the backyard, just about every time I'm reminded, I am reminded that this is not my forever home. Yes, I may live in Atmore for many years to come, but Atmore is not my forever home. And God has gently reminded me that He is building me a far better forever home in heaven. And I'm encouraged in that. So every time I hear that noisy, that noisy dump truck or I smell that asphalt, I just say to myself, I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. Our world needs happy and joyful Christians. Our world needs happy and joyful Christians. And I don't know what you've experienced or what small frustrations or big frustrations you've had, but walking around with a complaining and a critical spirit in your life, it breaks down intimacy with those who you love and you care about. They want to try to fix your anger or your frustration. When you walk with a complaining and critical spirit, it keeps you from enjoying unity and body in the body of Christ. It, it keeps you from loving and caring for others. And when you walk with a critical spirit, it keeps you from being an encouragement and a joy to others. And most importantly, when you walk with a critical and complaining spirit, it keeps you from connecting with your God. It keeps you connecting with God above because you're, you're complaining. You're not being thankful in all circumstances. And if I want to be an encouragement in this world, if I want to be a Dewberry Christian, as it were, then then I need to walk without criticism. I need to walk with joy without a complaining spirit. If that's your story, whether great or small, ask God to give you a new perspective. Ask Him to give you rejoicing. Ask Him to give you a thankful heart. Give Ask Him to restore your ability to pray without ceasing so you can stop quenching the Spirit. God wants this for us. God wants encouragement instead of criticism to flow out of us. The next letter is R. Review everything. Review everything. And we find that in verses 20 and verses through 22. Do not despise prophecies but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every evil. Do not despise prophecy. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every evil. Are there many prophecies about Jesus' second coming? Yes, there are. There are many prophecies about Christ's second coming. Don't forsake those prophecies. Are there many uh, people out there who misconstrue and use those prophecies for their own selfish gain? Yes, there are. Hold fast to what is good, what is good that they're saying, and abstain, reject what is evil. Don't despise prophecy. Test everything. Hold fast to it. Hang on to what's good. Reject the evil. I don't think this just declares or or can speak to spiritual prophecies found in the Scripture, although that's probably the top point. But I also think of the prophecies in which we declare in our daily living. The prophecies that I'm declaring right now as I preach, I'm prophetically declaring things from God's Word. Or the bold words we say with one another in conversations. In many ways, it's a prophecy. It's a declaration. Even articles we post on Facebook, things that we declare are almost a prophecy of our own internal heart coming out. Be wise in what we share. Be wise in what we say. Our Christ, the world does not need Christians 
who want to boldly proclaim things for themselves, but boldly proclaim the words of God. Be wise in your declaration. Seek to be loving and encourage one another. Listen, listen, listen. Review, review, review. Seek to hear God's voice in what we are declaring. Let our words be full of encouragement. And why is this important? The world looks in, others look in, and they see grumbling, complaining, arguing Christians, blaming everybody else. But what the world needs is Christians who say, this is what God's word says. I will walk in it confidently. Instead of saying, this is what this article says, or this is what that article says, what your world needs as encouragement is you to say, this is what God's word says, and I will stand upon it. So don't forsake God's word, don't forsake prophecies, but all this other stuff, it's not an encouragement, it's a discouragement to others. Listen, 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 review, review, review. Seek to hear God's voice in what you hear and what you declare. The final letter in being a Dewberry Christian is to yield completely to Christ. And we see that in verses 23 through 28. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who has called you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The end of this chapter, the end of this letter that Paul writes, it beautifully highlights the reason we're going through all these trials and all these difficult times. It is to sanctify us. It is to grow us as a follower of Christ. It is through the work of the Holy Spirit, through a relationship of Christ, both our body, soul, and spirit are being transformed and renewed. We see that it's more than just being an encouragement for the good of others. We see being an encouragement is our calling Verse 26 says that we are to greet each other, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, understanding this biblically, the culture of the day, to walk up and give someone a kiss was a good greeting. It was expected. It was okay. It was very common. Today, if you walked up and gave someone a kiss, they'd probably slap you. Or at least look at you like you have some weird motive. Personally, I don't know how I would feel if someone walked up and gave me a kiss, anyone other than my wife. I I would be very concerned because that's our culture. But what I see in this verse that, that we are to understand is that the essence of a Christian, the Christian life should be a kiss. The Christian life should be a holy greeting. When you walk in the room, the people that see you coming should say, Ah, yes! Here they come. Not, oh no, they have arrived. When we walk in the room, we want to be a kiss to those we enter into conversation with. An encouragement, a joy that we're present. This is what I believe it means to be a Dewberry Christian in a world full of thorns. God is calling us. God is giving us an awesome and a beautiful responsibility to be an encouragement to the world around us. You know, just think if each of us chose this next week to only encourage others with our words. Just think how others would feel. Just think how our perspective may change if we only choose to speak encouraging words instead of critical. (laughs) I think we'd find ourselves rejoicing, praying always, not quenching the spirit for sure. Christian, we are called to be an encouragement in a world full of thorns. May God bless you as you live to encourage one another. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your people today. I pray, Lord, that this this word from you would be an admonishment and encouragement to us to be faithful, to encourage one another, and to encourage those in our world. Father, may our words, may our actions, may our life 
bring honor and glory to you in all we say and do. May you be glorified. Ah, Father, may we encourage one another as the days seem darker and more and more discouraging. Father, may we ever look unto you, returning back to us. Oh, Father, may we we seek and enjoy the hope we have of knowing that we will be forever united with you. Bless your church today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.